You're listening to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. Big John McCarthy has witnessed the best that the UFC had to offer. That is it! Game, set, back! We have a new champion! Your backstage pass to the world of mixed martial arts and combat sports. Only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Let's get it all! Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Get It On with Big John McCarthy and me, Sean Wheelock. Every week on this podcast, John and I give you an inside look at MMA and combat sports, always separating fact from fiction. On this week's program, we'll examine the UFC's newly announced partnership with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency to create a comprehensive drug testing program. Big John and I will also discuss two incidents from last Saturday's UFC fight night in Brazil, the brutal low blow suffered by Ryan Jimmo in his bout versus Francimar Bajoso, and the illegal knee to the head of Hani Jason Bazeja thrown by Damon Jackson in a classic case of what is called playing the game. Plus, as we do on every episode of Let's Get It On, John will answer your questions. Ask away via email, info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Again, that's info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Remember that you can download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And of course, you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. Two weeks ago on this program, we discussed at length the new guidelines put in place by the Nevada State Athletic Commission for their drug testing policy. Now comes news, John, of the UFC's program and partnership with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, which was announced on Wednesday and which is clearly designed to revolutionize mixed martial arts. It's huge. It's a huge step by the UFC in saying, you know what, we're, we're tired of it. We're done. We're going to do something that is hopefully going to teach fighters you can't do this. And that's exactly what needs to be done. You know, it, unfortunately, there's going to be a victim. There's going to be someone as that first one that gets caught by this and gets stung and gets stung big time because the penalties are pretty severe. You're looking at, you know, two years for the first offense, up to four years if there is aggravated circumstances along with it, meaning possibly you tested before, you were caught before or something like that. You know, you get caught with a four-year suspension, you're basically looking at eh, possibly the end of your career. And so it is a huge step with what the UFC is doing. They're taking it very seriously. They're, they're making this, you know, a very, you know, punitive action if you do it. But that's what has to be done. And we talked about this before. You can't have these light penalties because then the fighter is going to look and say, it's worth it to me. I can win this much. By winning this fight and it's going to cost me this, uh, that's worth it. When you're looking at two years of your career up to four years of your career and a sizable chunk of your purse going to pay for the testing, they've now made it to where fighters really have to start thinking about what am I going to do. John, so the biggest thing for me out of all of this is that the UFC is not actually going to administer the program. They're going the third-party route, which is what all of the sports that fall under the U.S. Olympic Committee do, partnering just like the USOC does with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. So USADA, USADA, is going to fully run and administer all of the tests in competition, out of competition. There's going to be no direct involvement from the UFC. That, to me, is bigger than anything else. I fully agree. Smartest thing ever. I mean, look at When you (laughs) you have the NFL, they do their own testing. Now, it's not that the NFL itself is doing the testing. Obviously, they're doing it in-house. They have hired people that take care of that for the NFL. But there is no separation between the NFL and that drug-related you know, uh, sample and everything that goes along with it in the administering of the test and everything. And so you can have that situation where someone, and it d- doesn't mean that it's true, but someone has something that comes up and all of a sudden you know, a quarterback or a big-time player is caught with something, but then, well, they, they don't suspend him because there was extenuating circumstances off of it. And it looks to the average person, and the perception is, oh, they are covering for that player. It's, you know, and I'm not going to say Tom Brady would do this, but Tom Brady, you know, obviously he brings ratings to the NFL, and so they're going to let him play where if it was another player, they would have suspended him and they would have fined him. And that's the, what the UFC is doing with USADA here. 
there is a complete separation between church and state, basically, is what you're looking at. The UFC is paying for everything. They have hired USADA to be their drug testing agency. They are completely separated from it other than that they pay USADA for the test and they pay for the job that they're doing. But everything else is separated. There's a transparency there. And so USADA doesn't care if, you know, you know, a champion gets caught. They don't care. You know, and the UFC is looking at it like we want that separation. And that's the smartest thing they can have because there's nothing that anyone can say. If USADA screws up a test, it's not the UFC doing it. It's USADA. And, and that can happen and it may happen somewhere along the way. But I doubt that it's going to. And uh, the, that separation is great for the UFC itself. And look, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, this, this can really affect some of their fight cards. This can really affect you know, some of the fights that they're going to try to do if someone is dumb enough not to heed what is going on and tries to get away with something, this could really affect them in a bad way. But they're saying, we don't care. We're going we're gonna to handle it when that happens, and we want this done the right way. So the Nevada State Athletic Commission last month, they announced four categories of drugs, steroids, stimulants, diuretics, and sedatives. Under this new UFC program administered by USADA, there are two categories, specified substances, which include anabolic steroids, HGH, blood doping agents, and non-specified substances, which include marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. It's interesting, John, that immediately out of the gate on this, there's already the delineation between what Nevada is doing with four categories in this program with just two categories. Yeah, there's, there's a difference in it. But, you know, if someone fights under the UFC as one is on their roster, they're going to be under the USADA unless – you know, they end up fighting in the state of Nevada. Well, then they're, they're also under the purview of the Nevada State Athletic Commission. So they're going to have to, you know, fall in line with exactly whatever it is that Nevada has come up with as far as their regulation. The fighter doesn't get to sit there and say, well, I don't have to, you know, meet that criteria. No, they, meet, they have to meet both. And it's, this is a lot for the fighter to do. This is a lot for the fighter to learn. There's a lot of education that needs to be done. So we have fighters that know exactly what they can take, when they can take something. And, you know, it's just because a doctor, you go to the doctor because you're sick, doesn't mean you can just take anything. You've got to be smart enough to tell that doctor, look, at, I'm a professional athlete. I get tested. Can I do this? And then take the information that the doctor gives you and go to the criteria that USADA is going to give you and figure out, am I going to be able to take this or is this going to cause me a problem? There's a lot to be done here. There's a, you know, this is not something that's a simple, oh, just throw it in there and it's going gonna, it's gonna to work well. There's going to be mistakes in here, but it's the responsibility of the fighter to figure out what is going in their body. Already we're seeing on social media backlash and look, we live in an era, we all know this, where no matter what you do, if you say, I'm going to give free money away to everyone, someone's going to be mad at you. It's just the world that we live in. <laughs> but the backlash that I'm seeing right now, John, on social media, no one's really attacking the UFC and USADA for going after performance-enhancing drugs, PEDs. So if someone's on anabolic st steroids, there's always going to be someone who says, yeah, let them take whatever they want. But I think most sure. people are saying they're cheats. Where you're seeing maybe the backlash, maybe a little bit of the outcry are on, quote unquote, recreational drugs. People will say, you know what, if you're cheating with anabolics or you're spinning blood, that's one thing. But if you have a medical marijuana card and you're toking up out of competition or if you're a recreational cocaine user and you don't have a fight for four months, that's your own personal business. But as we talk talked about two weeks ago with Nevada – it's one thing for civil liberties, but you're playing under a different set of rules because you're an at-will contracted employee by the UFC. So it doesn't matter what you may want to do, what your state allows you to do, because you now have to answer to your employer. Absolutely. And it, look at, if you look at what USADA has, you know, out of competition testing, you can take the marijuana. They're not going to test you for it. You can take the cocaine. They're not going to end up testing you for it. It's in competition they're going to test you for it. That is a six-hour window before the weigh-in all the way to a six-hour window after your fight. So you're basically looking at about a 36-hour or so competition, in-competition window that you can't have those substances in your body for in-competition. It has nothing to do with out-of-competition. The only thing that's out-of-competition are those PEDs when we're talking about 
the steroids. We're talking about the testosterone. We're talking about the things that enhance your performance. So under this new plan put forth by the UFC and USADA, there are going to be a minimum of 2,750 drug tests administered when this starts in a 12-month cycle from July 1st of this year. It's in and out of competition testing. So that basically works out the five drug tests for every single contracted UFC fighter. And fighters now, including the international fighters, obviously, have to be in touch. That is what we saw with professional cyclists, the the Floyd Landis's and Lance Armstrong's of the world. You can't say, you know what, I was on a vacation in Reykjavik or I was on safari in <laughs> Johannesburg and you couldn't find me. You have to make your whereabouts known at all times. Yeah, you do. You know, if, you're, if you're trying to see the northern lights in Reykjavik, <laughs> good job. But uh, no, you've got to tell them. And it's, it's not so much that... Look, at, if you live in Los Angeles, California, and you're going to be going to Pasadena for the day, you don't have to put in that, oh, I'm in Pasadena. What you have to do is you have to, if you're going to be going away from your location, we'll say that, you know what, you're traveling, you live in Los Angeles, you're traveling to Las Vegas. You need to tell them, on such and such dates, I will be in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, you don't have to say I'm going to be in Henderson or I'm going to be, you know, over in Summerlin or any of those things, Las Vegas, Nevada, so they can get in touch with you and have a place that you need to show up within a certain amount of time. And that's what this kind of testing needs. That's what, that's the only way it's going to work. Because if you have it, you know, look at, there's, you know, the case, you know, of people running, you know, you run from a test, you know, they're going to zap you. You're not going to be able to just run from a test and they want to know where you're at and what days you're going to be there. So if they feel like testing you during that time, they're going to give you a location that you need to meet up with them within a certain amount of time, and you better be there. I just mentioned professional cycling, and the governing body is UCI. I'm not an expert on cycling yes. by any means. I'm, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting a little out of my realm of understanding, but clearly Lance Armstrong, the biggest cycling star of this generation, certainly for Americans, the, the biggest cycling star ever. That's a huge name. So USADA flows into WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. They didn't care. Is a third party, this isn't the UCI, the governing body of cycling doing this. They're going to take down the biggest stars. We talked about Floyd Landis. He had uh, elevated epitestosterone to testosterone levels. He was stripped of his Tour de France title, kicked out of cycling. Obviously, we know the downfall of Lance Armstrong. All of his titles were stripped. He was completely run out of all cycling. That, I think, is really the key point on a third party. They don't care. Big star, medium star, small star, pro debuter, it doesn't matter. As a third party, they don't have a financial interest in the UFC. Exactly. Their mission you, is to keep the sport clean. You can't have an interest. If you have an interest, there is going to be that, that, that conflict. And as soon as someone can look at even if it's not real, and, and say, look, at, there's a conflict of interest there, it starts to erode at your credibility. And this is... You know, look at, I was a huge Lance Armstrong fan. I mean, I thought, you know, what he did was phenomenal. And all the, you know, at times, you know, people were testing him and stuff. And I was even looking at it going, man, to be that good against guys that are, that are getting caught. Okay. You know, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. Cause, you know, and I didn't want it to happen. But, you know, you look at, you know, Travis Tiger is the person that was sitting on that podium with that UFC uh, press conference. That's the guy that took, Lance Armstrong down. That's a guy that Lance Armstrong threatened with all kinds of things that he had done with other people. And that's a guy that stood up to him because he had no interest in protecting anybody. He had an interest in doing what's right, what's right for the sports. And when it comes to competition, you know, they, there was a couple of things said in the po in the press conference yesterday that are absolutely true. And, you know, Dana said a couple of things that I loved. I don't give a damn what country you're from or what language you speak. Everyone knows what a cheater is. Everyone knows. And the second thing is these guys are not, you know, hitting a ball or kicking a ball or pedaling a bike against someone. Those kind of things, that's cheating. But what our guys are doing is physical and it's physical damage to another human being. And when you're enhancing that ability for you to physically damage someone, it becomes more than just cheating. This is, this has serious consequences associated with, with it, and that's why they need to get a handle on this, and that's why what they're doing is, in my opinion, fantastic for the sport. The biggest problem is I have a feeling that even Travis Tigart doesn't understand the UFC is not the sport. That's a promotion, the biggest promotion, 
but it ain't the sport. And there's a whole lot of MMA out there that people are part of that they need to get in line with what's going on here. Well, John, let's talk about that because this is much different than a state suspension. So let's say the Nevada State Athletic Commission suspends a fighter. All of the other ABC members don't technically have to, but most likely they'll honor that suspension. There's they will honor that suspension. Yeah, I, I think they will. Absolutely. You can always find a, a non-ABC Native American reservation. Tommy Morrison had sort of a hybrid MMA fight on, I believe, a Navajo <laughs> reservation in northern Arizona. They weren't an ABC member. You can exactly. obviously always go outside of the U.S. But yeah, by and large, they're going to honor that. But let's say it's a UFC suspension. It's not a state suspension. Mm -hmm. Let's say the ABC says... We don't think that that's a valid suspension. I'm not saying that's a likely occurrence, but it's certainly a possible occurrence. What happens then? What happens if you're suspended by the UFC for two years, you sue to get out of your contract? Now you could presumably go fight for another North American-based MMA organization, or you could go international to say one championship or KSW or deep. That's, I guess, the key point, what you're saying, John. UFC is huge, but they're not the sport of MMA. No, and that's, you know, the whole thing. When you look at it, obviously the UFC has got in their contract that they can test their employees or contractual employees. And if that test comes back in a, in a negative fashion, they have the ability to suspend them and hold on to their contract. So the real question is not if uh, someone gets tested and pops hot. The UFC is going to be able to suspend them as the employer. The real question comes into how long will that suspension be and can someone get out of their contract if they test hot and move themselves to another spot? The, you know, the first person that you're going to look at that's going to be the question here, and has, this has nothing to do with the UFC testing, is Vanderlei Silva. You know, Vanderlei ended up getting popped by the Nevada State Athletic Commission for non-compliance clients not testing running from a test and then they ended up suspending him indefinitely they gave him a lifetime ban now the courts have come back and said no you can't do that he's not going to have a lifetime ban but the real question is he still is under contract with the ufc so the ufc having that contract are they going to let him out of the contract if they do he's going to go to the only place he can go he can go to brazil possibly and fight there I uh, can't do it under, you know, CABA, uh, which is the uh, association that governs MMA now mostly through Brazil. But there's, you know, little offshoot shows that he could fight, but he's not going to make money there. But he could go to Asia. He could go to, you know, one fighting championship and, you know, they're going to pay him and he could fight there and he's not going to get tested. So there are places that guys could go. They could go to, you know, KSW in Poland and, you know, fight there. But guys fight not so much for the fight they fight for money and they fight for the publicity behind it they fight for the other things that come with it and they're not, he's not going to get that you know if he, if he goes over and fights in 1FC he's not going to get that with KSW people want the that media attention behind him and you get that big media you know flow from the UFC that there's a lot of things that come with that and when you don't have that it alters you know how much value there is in going and fighting for someone else but someone can do it but in the end people are going to just start to have to get in line they're going to have to get in line with what is expected of them they're going to have to train right they're going to have to do things right and in doing that it's going to clean the sport up and that's what we need i fully agree with you it is definitely what we need but let's look more at the slippery slope john so under this new ufc usada uh drug testing program announced theoretically a fighter who pops third time on steroids could face a 16-year suspension. Let's say they're 20 years old. Lifetime be, suspension. Absolutely, lifetime suspension. So so let's say they're 20 years old. Be interesting to see if that held that up means taking legally. Drugs pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> We're just speaking they're, theoretically. Yeah. Or let's say they're right, 25. Let's, go. let's say they're 25, but even 16 okay. puts them at 41 then or a lifetime suspension. That would be an interesting issue for courts. I don't know if that would move to a state court or it could possibly move to a federal court because of contract in international commerce or interstate commerce. It would be interesting to see, though, if the UFC said, we are suspending you from our organization for 16 years or for life or even, say, for two years. 
Could you then sue right to work and say, I went out of my contract and now I'm a free agent? Maybe Bellator won't have me. Maybe World Series of Fighting won't have me. Maybe even someone like a Titan won't have me. But possibly I could go and I could fight for SFL in India or I could fight for deep in Japan. Yeah, I mean, look at these are all issues that can come up and possibly will. But the the real question is this. If you have that person that, you know, pops hot and third time and we'll say gets the lifetime ban from the UFC. And we'll say they're a great fighter. Well, they can go and try to get you know out of the contract that they have. And I'm sure a lot of courts will do that. But it's no different than if you have you know a firefighter that goes and he, go- he goes and he ends up driving drunk and gets caught. And he ends up getting arrested. Well, he gets punished by his department. And then he does it a second time and he does it a third time where the the department actually fires him for his conduct, conduct unbecoming of a firefighter. And so he's now fired from his job. Can he go and apply in another fire department? Absolutely he can. How many do you think are going to hire him? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. None. Now, his profession is being a firefighter, but... No one's going to hire him because his background has shown of what he does. Now, it's different in fighting because, yes, there are those places. You can go to Asia and possibly still get a fight. But, again, that's not the place most people want to be because it's just not big enough anymore. When Pride was there, it was a big place. It was big fights. There was some exposure here in North America with it. And so guys were you know, in a position to say, yeah, I'll go fight there. It's more money, maybe not as much exposure, but it's got some, and I, that's where I'm going to go. But you had guys that didn't do it. Randy Couture never went. Randy had the opportunity to go to Pride and looked at everything and basically said, you know what? I'd like to go f- compete there. There's guys I'd like to compete against, but... I think that in the end, for me, it's going to be better to stay in America and fight in America for what I want to do. And, you know, he wanted to get in movies and stuff, and so he made the right choice for him. But these are all things that are going to come about, you know, somewhere down the road. It's going to happen, and we're going to see what happens with it. Every week on Let's Get It On, we bring you our poll question. You, of course, can cast your vote on our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. This week's poll question, are you in favor of the UFC's new drug testing program? Vote yes or no at letsgetitonpodcast.com. John, I believe that there are going to be a substantial number of people in our listening audience who say they're not in favor. They're going to say it's too restrictive, it's too punitive. There are a lot of people that have a tough time, as we talked about earlier, when you're throwing drug use in marijuana, throwing that in with anabolic steroids, for instance. It'll be interesting to see. I always find it fascinating on our poll questions. Things that we think are going to go one way, oftentimes will go the other. And we have so many great international listeners. A lot of times your opinions are shaped in the type of country you grew up with, that political system, looking at social liberties, values, things like that. I think this is a really interesting poll question. It is, and it's going to be interesting to see the way people look at it, but you know, attitudes do change depending upon where people are from. But the one thing that everyone has to understand is, again, and we said it how many times in the past, fighting is not a person's right. It's a privilege. And it's a privilege that you have to follow certain rules and criteria to be part of. And it's not the same as being a citizen of you know, the U.S. or a citizen of Holland where here's your rules and, okay, you, this is what's allowed. And, yes, you can get a medical marijuana card or, yes, you can smoke marijuana and, and buy it freely in Colorado or any of those things. That's, that's great. That's that country's laws or that state's laws, but those are not the laws that a fighter must follow when they sign on the dotted line with a promotion. They must follow the promotion's rules of conduct and when they get a license with a state athletic commission they need to follow the rules and regulations of that state athletic commission that's what they're signing their name saying that i'm going to do you're putting your name you come into this world with very little when you're given that name that is who you are are you a man of your word are you a woman of your word are you going to follow and put your name down and say i will do what it says yes or no that's what it comes down to John, you, of course, have refereed MMA all over the world. I've been fortunate enough to commentate MMA all over the world. And you and I both know in countries like Brazil, in Spain, in Bulgaria, South Korea, 
you don't have the equivalent of the ABC. Brazil is trying, but then a media report came out. I saw it on MMA Junkie saying that there were no actual drug tests that took place at last Saturday's UFC fight night in Brazil. This changes it with the UFC because if you're going outside of the ABC, the United Kingdom, for instance, there's no equivalent of the ABC. The promoter is able to assign the officials, control the cage side physicians, the judges, the referees, the inspectors backstage because there's no ABC equivalent. There's no British Board of Boxing Control or whatever is the oversight regula regulator for Great Britain. But with this UFC, USADA drug testing policy for all events, US, Canada, internationally, doesn't matter where a fighter hails from, that really supersedes the fact that, all right, we're in a loosely commissioned or a no commissioned nation. Absolutely. You look and it's, uh, this is the, you know, one of the things that came up is with all of this testing, the fighter is going to end up having, you know, I think Lawrence Epstein's the one that said it, this biological passport. I really liked when he said that. I liked great the term. term of it because it is, and it's a great thing for a commission that doesn't have the ability to test. It's okay. It's being done for you. And, you know, you know, when you look at it, it's not so much, you know, there are, there are testing labs in Brazil. And USADA can go and say, we want these fighters tested. We want all the fighters tested. And that testing lab in Brazil is going to go and test all those fighters. And it's going to have nothing to do with the commission that is part of, you know, the uh, commission that's been set up in Brazil. They're not going to be in charge of that at all. That's all going to be done through USADA with the use of the Brazilian, you know, lab itself. And they're going to get that same testing done without the commission having to do it. So this is, this is a great thing as far as, in my opinion, for the sport everywhere around the world. It doesn't matter where you go. If you're part of the UFC, you're going to be tested. You're going to be tested a lot, and you better clean up your act if you're not doing things the right way. John, final point on this. Do you see this as kind of that watershed moment in the evolution of our sport? And sometimes I think we have to step back and realize how young this sport is, that we go back to November 12, 1993. I mean, you're talking about the NFL started in 1920. I think Major League Baseball, I think the National League started in 1876. So we're a really, really young sport. But for you, is this that turning point moment that maybe future MMA historians look back in 50 or 100 years and say, wow, this is when the sport kind of went in a different direction? The, in, in my opinion, it is absolutely what you're saying. It's a watershed moment because of the fact that look at Nevada just recently, as we talked about before, it came out with very strict guidelines. And I, and I loved it, and I thought it's the right thing to do, and I think Nevada was exactly in line with doing what needed to be done. But Nevada is one state within the United States that holds, if you're looking at it, you know, MMA-wise, it's, you know, probably 30 shows a year, boxing-wise, another 25. So about 55 shows a year are being done by the Nevada State Athletic Commission, where when the UFC has come out and, and done what it's doing here with their athletes, their fights go all over the world. They're in, you know, all over, obviously, North America. They have, can you know, you look at Toronto, they'll go to California, they'll go to New Jersey, they'll go to Brazil, they'll go to Japan, they'll go back to Texas, then they'll go over to, you know, Boston, and then they're going to head themselves to Germany. It doesn't matter where they're going. That testing is now taking place. So it's going to have a, a much bigger impact than just what Nevada did because Nevada can only control the fights that are taking place within their state where this is now going to follow the athlete. The athletes are being followed no matter where they go. They're being tested. So this is a watershed moment for the cleaning up of MMA. The biggest thing is other promotions have got to get in line with what you know, the UFC has set as the standard now. They've got to start enforcing things. The biggest difference is most promotions that people know of, you know, Bellator, Bellator doesn't travel throughout you know, the world, really. They're traveling throughout North America. Uh, you can look at the World Series of Fighting. Again, they're not traveling throughout the world. They're traveling throughout North America. But there are those promotions out there. You know, you get the M1s, you get the Deeps, you get the KSWs. Those are in certain countries. They don't travel a lot. M1s traveled a little bit. But this is overall, this is the type of thing that needs to be done throughout the sport of MMA to clean it up.
Fully agreed. Extremely well said. Well, every week on this podcast, John and I answer your questions. Ask away via me- email, info at let's get it on podcast.com. Again, email us at info at let's get it on podcast.com. And of course, please, please, please include instructions on how to correctly pronounce your name. First up, a name that needs no pronunciation guide. It is Justin Brown. And Justin writes, John, I have the honor and privilege of working with you on June 19 in St. Louis for the Bellator event as a judge. Any tips on how to maximize this experience? Maximize the experience. Just stay away from me so it's all a good night for you. (laughs) Uh, uh, You know what? As far as maximizing the experience, if you're judging, the one thing that I would say is, you know, whoever is there, I'm going to be there and what other officials are there. You know, if the, the, the way to maximize your experience is, you know, Let's talk, ask questions, you know, it, let's get everything that you have as something that you're not sure about out in the open and that you can get clarified for you. You know, why don't you come in the, you know, the back and watch when we do fighter meetings and see what is said to the fighters and let them, you know, and listen to what, you know, goes on between that. When it comes to the judging, be open about what you do, be open about how you see things, be open about listening to other people and their concepts of what's important in the fight and what's not. That would be the way that I would tell you is to maximize that night for you. You know, open up, you know, ask questions, be humble in the way that, you know, you, you look at things, but be open to saying, well, I like to do it this way and be open to saying, you know what, uh, I think my way is best or I think, you know what, that way is better. And Justin, I say this sincerely, definitely come to the commentary table, say hi to Jimmy Smith and me, find us before we go on air with the prelims on spike.com, really would like to talk to you. And John, I've always had this position as a referee, see your fellow officials, fellow inspectors, commission members as part of your team. Don't just show up and be solitary, hang out with everybody. Do that Absolutely. backstage. Mike Mazzulli at Mohegan Sun, he has a little VIP hospitality room. It's not a VIP room. It's it's a room. It's a hospitality <laughs> room for all the VIP officials. <laughs> <laughs> There's usually some meatballs in there and bottled water. But he brings everybody together. So you're on the team, not just with your fellow judges. You're on the team with John and whoever else referees on the show, uh, Tim Lukanoff and the state of Missouri people, the inspectors, everybody. That's your team. I would say maximize that social experience. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's an honor to be able to be part of that show. You know, you, you should be honored uh, that you're able to work that and enjoy it and make the most of every bit of it. And the whole thing out of that I look at it is, you know, realize how lucky you are. Realize how lucky you are to be able to walk in that arena, walk down to that cage, go and introduce yourself to Sean Wheelock and Jimmy Smith, be able to be part of MMA. That's the payoff for doing what you do. That's the big thing. Everyone thinks about money and we don't make that much money, but the payoff is being able to be part of it. And then the added attraction into that is if you can educate yourself, if you can learn something from anybody that night that's going to make you better, you just had a good night. Our next question comes from Patrick Gribben, who did include a pronunciation guide. Thank you very much for that, Patrick. He asked, John, when you see a fighter in a bad situation, what is the quote-unquote intelligent defense that you look for? Is it merely blocking the strikes? Is it the ability to keep moving and improving position? Or is it a combination of both? And, Patrick continues, is a fighter's reputation for toughness taken into consideration when a referee is considering stopping the fight? (laughs) That's a good question. Really good. uh, Yeah, it is. And we take a lot of those things into consideration other than is the fighter's toughness uh, considered. It doesn't matter how tough somebody is. When they have become overwhelmed in the fight, it's time to get them out. And that can happen to someone that is incredibly durable, someone you know, that is you know, known to be able to take a, a high level of damage and keep going. That doesn't matter once they've shown that they can no longer be competitive in the fight. If they're no longer competitive in the fight, our job is to take them and get them out of something that can only lead to damage of them for the future. So when we're saying, you know, what is intelligent defending yourself? When you, when you ask the question and you sit there and you say they're blocking punches. Well, if they're blocking the punches, it doesn't matter what position they're in. If they're blocking the blows that are being thrown at them, then they're intelligently defending themselves because there's only one way that you can block the blow. Now, the question is, what is your interpretation of blocking the blow 
and what is my interpretation of blocking <laughs> the ball? Okay, because you'll get a lot of people, you know, they'll sit there and they'll say, well, he was hitting his hand because the fighter puts their hand up against their head and has an open hand and the, his opponent is hitting the actual hand, which is against the fighter's head. And you look and you say, but he, but he was hitting the hand. No, he's hitting the hand, but the blow is being transferred into the fighter's brain. And that's what we're concerned with. It's not so much, yes, the glove is not touching the, the side of the head or the face. It's touching another glove. But there is a trauma and force that is being generated through, through that blow that is generating a force into that fighter's brain. And that's the most important element they have. So when we, when we sit there and say they're blocking, we can have someone that's in a, we'll say, a mounted. They're in a mount position. They have their hands in front of their face. But as the referee, I see that they're looking at their opponent. They don't close their eyes because as soon as someone starts to close their eyes, they're telling you, uh, I'm in trouble because we do not allow blind people to fight. There's a reason why. Because you close your eyes doesn't mean it's going to go away. <laughs> okay? It's going to be there and it's going to be coming at you in a bad way. So we can have someone that's mounted. They're looking at their opponent and they're actually – putting their arms in a way to block what is being thrown at them. And we're going to let that fighter go because they are intelligently defending themselves. What we're looking for, what we, what I tell fighters in the back and Sean, you've been there when I've said it to him, look at if a fighter, I'll tell the fighter, if you get hurt, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but if you get hurt by something in the fight, you get hit with a shot, you go down. Your job is to show me. And I usually say show stupid here that John, I want to be here. John, I want to go. Let me go. And you do that by fighting back. You do that by trying to grab a hold and hold on to your opponent, pull him close. You do that by movement. You do that by blocking the things that are being thrown at you. You do not do that by trying to hide. When you start to try to hide, you start to put both hands on one side of your head and you just accept blows, you're hiding, you're not intelligently defending yourself, and you're looking for me to stop the fight. If I have the ability to give you time to try to tell you, hey, I don't like what you're doing, I will, and I'll call out their name. I'm going to call out the fighter's name and I'm going to tell them, you know, if it was, you know, Joe, Joe, move, get out. When I tell you move, get out, it is telling you that I am, if you stay with what you're doing, I'm going to stop your fight. So I need you to try to either move the position so your opponent has to change what they're attacking you with, try to take away what they're attacking you with. I don't care if you're successful. I care that you're trying. If you're trying, I will let the fight go on. It's when you don't try or you can't, you get stuck in a position that you don't understand how to get out of and you're just accepting damage and you can't get out of it, the fight's coming to an end. And fighters understand that. There's many times fighters will... They're not going to tap out. They're going to put it on the official to get them out of the fight because they look at it like, oh, the referee stopped the fight on me. It's not that I quit. And that's okay. They can do that. But we're always there looking to see, is the fighter trying to intelligently defend themselves? Great questions. Keep flowing in from our listening audience around the world. Do keep them coming. Remember, email us. Anything you'd like to ask, info at let's get it on podcast.com. Still to come on this week's episode of Let's Get It On, John and I will examine two incidents from last Saturday's UFC fight night in Brazil, a brutal low blow and a not very brutal knee to the head, both of which raise larger questions in the realm of MMA officiating. With Big John McCarthy, I'm Sean Wheelock, and you are listening to Let's Get It On. Hey everyone, join me and Sean Wheelock in St. Louis, Missouri. You have a chance to win two tickets to Bellator's unfinished business with Ken Shamrock and Kimbo Slice. What I need you to do, if you can be there on June 19th for that show, I need you to go to www.letsgetitonpodcast.com and click the Win the Bellator Ticket button. When you click on that button, you need to fill out the form, and then you need to share the contest on your Facebook or Twitter and listen to Let's Get It On to hear the winner announcements. If you want to be part of the show, you want to see Ken Shamrock against Kimbo Slice in person, along with me and Sean Wheelock, be sure to enter. Go to letsgetitonpodcast.com. For all of our listeners looking for great new designs in MMA apparel, look to the new clothing styles of Lambs to Lions. 
That's right, Lambs to Lions has got new styles with old and new put together. Boxing, MMA, everything. Go to lambstolionsbrand.com and check out their line of clothes. Kimbo Slice, Ken Shamrock. On Friday, June 19th, they finally get to settle unfinished business. Are you ready? As Bellator MMA, presented by Miller Lite, is live from the Scott Trade Center. This fight is over! Plus, former lightweight world champion and Mizzou Wrestling All-American Michael Chandler comes home to battle Derek Campos. Oh my Here's God, Dan! It's Kimbo versus Shamrock, live from the Scott Trade Center. Get your tickets now at the box office, Ticketmaster, or Bellator.com. Now, back to Let's Get It On with your hosts, Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock. This past Saturday at UFC Fight Night in Brazil, Ryan Jimmo suffered a low blow in the second round of his fight versus Francimar Bajoso, which was so devastating that Jimmo took the full five-minute break, during which time he was visibly heaving and clearly in agony. John, as I watched this, I didn't even think that Ryan Jimmo would probably continue in this fight, but he did, and he wound up losing a unanimous decision. Yeah, it's that's a real hard situation for Ryan, and uh, there was a lot of things. Kevin McDonald was the uh, referee. Kevin's a great referee, and he did a lot of really good things in there. But I was, as I was watching the fight, the, my real question was, all right, let's see, is Kevin going to take a point from him? And the reason I'm saying is Kevin going to take a point from him is – as an official, we have to have things set in our mind as far as when things have reached a level that we need to do something to try to even the fight back out. And when I say even the fight back out, when you have an illegal blow such as Bahoso landed on Jimmo, that kick at the time that he landed the kick, as the official, I'm looking at Bahoso and I'm starting to say he's getting tired. And he is starting to gas in the fight a little bit. And Jimmo is actually starting to do well in the fight. And then Jimmo gets hit with the kick. It's a solid kick. Oh, it was awful. I'm not, it was awful. I'm not saying, it? yeah, and I'm not saying it was what we would say is intentional because everything that we want to look at is what was the intent, but what was the effect? And when we have the intent and the effect are what we're going to base our decisions may, uh, off of. And when you look at a guy who were – Kevin McDonald ends up bringing in a bucket for Ryan Jimmo to possibly throw up in, and he's dry heaving into the bucket. It's telling you that that kick has had a very negative effect on the fighter. And this is when we start to take points from a fighter, even though it may not have been intentional. We take a point because we have had a fighter that is damaged. And when we don't take the point, which is what in the end happened, Kevin decided not to take the point. He can do that. That is his right. It's not that he did anything wrong. It is, who would you rather be? I can be Ryan Jimmo, who has suffered this kick. I have spent f five minutes, basically, on my hands and knees, not feeling well, because you've ever been kicked good in the groin. It'll, you know, it'll definitely change your perspective of life for a while. But you can be him, or you can be Bohoso, who was – Tired, but now has gained a five-minute rest. All he's been doing is standing there. He's been getting his heart rate down, and he has not been damaged in any fashion. So which guy do you want to be? Well, it's pretty clear to say, I want to be Bohoso at this point. And so as the official, these are the times that we will take a point, and there's going to be a lot of people out there, you never warned him, you never gave him a warning. You don't have to warn somebody. It is what was the intent? I don't think that the intent was there to purposely kick Ryan in the groin. What was the effect? The effect was so great to the fighter that I'm going to take a point based upon I need to try to level this playing field back out. So Bohoso knows, oh, I need to win this round for this to be an even round. Go ahead, try to win the round. But if you don't, you're going to be two points down in it because of the damage you did to Ryan Jimmel with that kick. John, that's a point intent versus not having intent that I think really confounds a lot of fighters. Because if you look at early UFC fights, Zane Frazier versus Kevin Rozier, 
clearly Zane Frazier, and he told our Davy in the fighter meeting, you were there, that in Kenpo we, we do groin strikes, that's what I'm going for, uh, of infamous early UFC fight, you referee Keith Hackney versus Joe Son, <laughs> shot after shot, full intent from Keith Hackney to the cup, but we don't see that in MMA anymore. So fighters will say, I didn't mean to do it, it wasn't my intent. But of course, to your point, what you're saying is it's not just the intent, it's the intent, it's the resulting action. Absolutely. I, I mean, I've had guys tell me, you know, oh, I didn't mean that. And it's like, don't tell me that. You did it on purpose. I could see it. You know, I've had guys headbutt someone. Well, there's only one way that you purposely head some, you know, you, you headbutt someone. It can happen with a clash of heads. It's a, you know, that's something that happens, which is unintentional. But when you rear your head back on a grounded opponent, you take and you strike down. Yeah, it was intentional. And, you know, I've had those. That, oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, yes, you did. But many times we have fouls that, you know, are not intentional. They're accidental by nature, but they have such a great effect on the opponent that we as an official need to do something to try to even this out. And that's really what I think was missing out of that fight. It wouldn't have changed the outcome of the fight. The outcome of the fight would have been the same. Bohoso won a unanimous decision. He won at 30-27, I think, on uh, two cards, and he won at 29-28. So that's right. it would have changed the score, but it wouldn't have changed the outcome. But at least it's what we as officials can do to try to make it to where someone realizes, I can't just get away with doing something here. I can't just land that kick and then, oh, well, it was the first time. It doesn't matter if it's the first time. Everyone gets this thing, oh, you have to warn someone. No, you don't. You do not have to warn someone. You, ba you base everything based upon what effect did it have in the fight. I'm not going to presume to say I would know how to handle anyone else's fighter, and I'm not going to presume to know what Ryan Gemmo's corner was thinking. I'll just tell you, John, that if that's my fighter and he's taking the full five minutes, he took that shot. He now is heaving into a bucket. It was unclear to me watching on Fox Sports 1 if he actually threw up. I'm not sure that he did, but he was close to throwing up. That's why Kevin McDonald, the referee, ordered in the bucket. If that's my fighter. I think we're getting out of there. I don't see a reason to continue because it's what I call the two-thirds, three-fifths rule. You were still in round two of a three-round fight. This is going to be a no contest. It could be a DQ. It's not going to be a DQ. So it's going to be a no contest. You don't love a no contest. You don't love a draw. But can your fighter really recover from that to come back and win the fight? Yeah, I mean, you look at it and it's, you know, that's probably the smartest, especially since, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know the end result. You know that Ryan didn't uh, come back in the fight and do anything to, you know, overwhelm Bohoso and he ended up losing the decision. But I think his corner is looking at, you know, looking at Ryan and thinking, you know, they believe in their fighter and they believe that he can beat Bohoso. They believe that he can knock him out. They believe that he can win this round. And they don't know what the score is, you know, being put down by the judge. And so hindsight, yeah, I'm sure now they would say, we wish that we had told him, you know, hey, don't go on. But I give Ryan Jimmo a ton of credit. You know, he's a warrior. He's a tough dude. Um, he went out there, he did his very best. He got hurt with a, you know, an illegal shot. He came back and, and again, fought to the very best of his ability and he lost the decision. But, you know, now I'm sure his corner would look at it the same way you do. Yeah. And full credit to Ryan Jimmo. And, and this is yeah, not something absolutely. I put on a fighter. All the fights that I've commentated, I've only seen one fighter not continue from a low blow. That was a Bellator we did in Lewiston, Maine. It was Marcus Davis, and he landed a low blow on Watchim Spirit Wolf, one of the toughest people I've ever met in my life. Spirit Wolf did not continue, and it was ruled a no contest. But generally, the fighter, if they can possibly do so, they're going to continue on. It's a difficult situation. You're right. It's easy for me to play hindsight, but I'll tell you as I'm watching on TV, once the bucket came in, I thought maybe you want to think about getting your fighter out of there. But then I also understand the dynamics. You've traveled from Canada to Brazil. You've spent a lot of time in training camp, a lot of time just getting there, cutting weight. You don't want that no contest. It just doesn't leave anybody with a good taste in their mouth. No, it's like kissing your sister, and I totally understand why they're looking at it that way. But – you know, you know, you always need to look at what's best for your fighter and you need to look at the reaction of your fighter and what, you know, how they're handling it. And I'll, I'll give, you know, Ryan credit. I thought, you know, he handled it well. I thought Kevin actually did a really good job of managing the time with, with Ryan. And, you know, as Ryan got up and says, you ready? He goes, Hey, you got a little bit more time, take more time because he's trying to give him everything he can 
to you know get himself back to as close to what he was before that kick occurred, even though that's never going to get all the way. There's no way he can do it. But it's it's a situation. There's a lot you know. There's a lot of different opinions on how to do things, and you know there's people that think that you know if someone does a foul, no matter what, take a point. Well, if officials did that, then people would be very upset with officials because this is not like, you know, this is not like the NFL where, oh, you get a five-yard penalty or you get a a 15-yard penalty. When we take a point, it's like giving a score to the opposing team. There's a lot behind it. You know, that one point can have a huge effect. So it's not like, you know, the official is going to just, you know, arbitrarily just freely take something like that. They, there's a lot of thought process that goes behind it. But we always need to have the thought process of, did this fight end up becoming, you know, swayed and unfair now based upon an injury that was due to a foul? Is this fight in a position where I need to try to level it back out to an even playing field, that level playing field? based upon taking a point for the action, even though it wasn't intentional. I'm going to say it was an accidental foul, but I'm still taking a point based upon the entire effect. That's where the job of being official becomes difficult. John, would you ever rule a disqualification for one illegal action that you deemed unintentional? Can you ever foresee that type of occurrence? Uh, You know, I I would never say never, but I'm trying to think what it would even be. Especially when you're saying unintentional. Unintentional. You know, you know it, when you're saying it's unintentional to say that I'm going to disqualify someone off of it, I, I don't see it. I, don't, I can't picture that you know, situation that I would be able to feel comfortable with me doing that to them. But again, I would never say never. There's got to be something possibly out there, but I don't think I would. What if you had a situation where the fighter landed a soccer kick to the head, but you realized that they just completely were unaware of the situation like maybe they're a european fighter and they had fought in promotions in eastern europe where that was allowed could you ever foresee that type of situation where they did it and they immediately took it back like oh i forgot the rule yeah well the, that doesn't matter because you just changed it to intentional they kicked the, the kick that they landed was an intentional kick then they, they didn't mean to do it. it for the head great point. so you know right there you just changed it from that's not it's not accidental that's an intentional you may have Forgot the rule, and that's all fine, but we just switched it over into another realm. So it, it, that's when you say it's, that was an accidental foul, but I'm going to disqualify someone. Again, I don't know of a time that I would ever do that, but I'll never say that I'll never because there could be something that comes up where I could say, you know what, that's the right thing to do. But you know, I've disqualified people. I don't like disqualifying people. I take it very seriously. It's something that we, you know, n- never want to do. I've had fights where I should disqualify people, but I don't, you know, and I don't based upon, you know, truthfully the fact that what they did was bad, but their opponent was not so hurt by it that they can't go on and their opponent wants to fight. And so, hey, you did it. Now I'll let this guy come and try to punch, you know, punch you in the face again just to, you know, show you that you made a mistake in doing it. But that's the, the best payback I can give him. So I won't disqualify him so he can have that time with him in the ring. But most of the time, you know, that disqualification is a very rare effect. It was very clear. And Fox Sports 1 kept replaying and replaying and replaying and replaying (laughs) that kick by Bohoso to the groin of Jimmo. So there was no doubt that Jimmo took the full brunt of that kick. But have you ever found yourself in a situation, John, where you thought – that the fighter, even though it was a foul and illegal action, the fighter was milking it. They said they didn't want to continue after five minutes. I guess technically then that fighter would lose on timidity if they didn't want to continue. But that's a really difficult decision to make that, well, that the is. fighter the fighter suffered an illegal action, but now he's going to lose because he doesn't want to continue fighting. Oh, I've had fighters many times think that a foul was going to get them a, a disqualification, get them to win. Or they were trying to get out of the fight, you know, and they felt like, oh, I, I can get out of this fight and save face. And it's like, no, you know, sometimes we need to, you know, be the bad guy. And we do things based upon what's fair, you know, and there's times when fighters will, you know, get hit by an illegal blow. But you can tell you're right there. That was not hard. It didn't hit you flush. It glanced off you. Yes, it was illegal. 
Yes, it touched you, but it didn't damage you. But the fighter is going to act like it did. You know, and you, we've had, you know, instances where, you know, we've had fighters, Josh Koscheck, you know, you know, feigned, you know, getting kneed to the head where the whole thing missed him. You know, now the, the referee at the time thought it hit him, so he gave, gives him the time. But, you know, he's sitting there lying on the ground holding his head, and it's like, really? You know, and the fighters are going to do whatever they can to get that win. And, you know, if they, I always go, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, that's fine. It's my <laughs> job to, to pull you out of it. But I've had many times fighters, you know, you know, say, I can't go on. I said, okay, that's fine. I'm telling you right now, if you don't go on, this fight's going to end and you're going to be the loser. What? I don't know. I'm just telling you right now. So you decide what you want to do. And they lose through <laughs> and timidity. I, and that, would be the, that would be the rule, right? You, they would lose through timidity. Well, they can lose through a lot of things. You know, it's a matter of, you know, sometimes we'll have fighters get hit with something. The doctor comes in and they'll say, you know, oh, he, he can go on. And the fighter will go, oh, I, I, I need more time. You don't have any more time. Well, well, I, I can't go on. Okay, fight's over. TKO, right? And they're like, well, no, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. You don't have the ability to determine how much time you get. The only time you do is if you're Ryan Jimmo with the low blow. You get the low blow, the fighter's in control of it. Anything else, the referee is in control of it. And the referee sometimes will manage that time based upon do they know that was a damaging blow or was that that thing did not hit you with any effect you should not be giving me the the acting that you're giving me right now i'm going to say hey let's go get up we're going to fight and if you don't want to then you're going to lose john final point on this is i watched the fight i had to laugh at this situation jimmy smith and i talk about this all the time on our bell tour broadcast no matter who the fighters are no matter where the fighter if the fight is taking place in the world this was of course in brazil when there's a low blow somebody in the crowd boos it's just a weird almost like blink reaction i never know exactly why they're booing are they booing because they thought they were cheating are they booing because they thought the fighter wasn't really kicked are they booing out of frustration but if you go back and you watch that fight someone boos i defy anybody to tell me they've ever watched an mma fight where someone suffered a low blow time was called and someone in the crowd did not boo <laughs> I didn't what, what is that uh, you know i i always look and say and anytime the referee stops the fight, people boo, you know, and it's like, well, go ahead, boo, whatever, you know, and they're booing because they want, you know, the action to continue and you're holding up what, you know, they want to see. It could be that they're, you know, booing the actual blow and saying, oh, that was cheap. It could be that they're booing say, oh, I don't think that hit him flush, but it, you're right. It always happens. <laughs> but I always say it's because the referee's going, stop. <laughs> That's probably what it is, actually, just – Booing. Uh, some some people, they, they will not be satisfied in a combat sport, no matter what it is, until there's a full-on decapitation. And even then, they'll boo the referee if they stop it due to decapitation. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, you stop it too soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, also on that really entertaining UFC fight night card in Brazil, Hani Jason Bezeja defeated Damon Jackson by first-round submission. Now, a key point in that fight occurred when Damon Jackson was ruled by referee Kevin McDonald to have thrown an illegal knee to the head of Bezeja in a situation where Bezeja was doing what we call John playing the game. Yeah, and this is a situation. I don't know what Kevin says in the back, you know. I, I've gone with a lot of officials and listened to what they say, and I've, I, I know Kevin well, and I've never done that with Kevin, so I don't know what he says. But you know, I'm very clear when I make you know my my fighter meeting what being a grounded fighter is, and you know, there's a there's a misperception out there that you know a grounded fighter is you know three points of contact. That is not what a grounded fighter is. A grounded fighter is any part of the fighter that touches the ground other than just the soles of their feet makes them a grounded fighter. So if I have a fighter that is, you know, knocked down and is just on their butt, their feet are in the air, their hands are in the air, only their butt is in contact. We really got one point of contact, but we have a grounded fighter. It's more than just the soles of his feet. So we have a lot of people that, you know, get confused by what is actually, you know, the context of a grounded fighter. And then when we talk about fighters grounding themselves, taking a hand, being in a standing position and putting their hand down to the ground, I tell fighters all the time, you know, if you want to make yourself a grounded fighter and you want to put your hand down to the ground, I'm telling you, do not put your hand down with your fingertips just touching the ground. And that's what Bezeha, you, that's what Bezeha did in that situation. Exactly. Yeah, I want you to bear weight on your hand. There must be weight borne on your hand. Once you bear weight, the rule will say that you are down. 
don't play the game of just putting your fingertips so your one finger is on the ground with your other fingers hovering you know above the canvas that is not what i'm looking for to say that you're down you want to make yourself down then put yourself in that down position put all those fingers down put the palm of your hand down bear weight on your hand whichever it's going to be and you're a grounded fighter because damon jackson can't see damon jackson is in a position above honey and all he sees is what he thinks is his arm in a position where, oh, I can knee now, and he knees. It's absolutely non-intentional, but he knees him when his actual fingertip is on the ground. Kevin was right. You know, He came in, he stopped the action, and he pulled Damon off, but this is where it would have been best if we had explained to Hani exactly, this is what I want to see out of you. Then that knee that was thrown by Damon, that's not going to be an illegal knee because you've told him what you expect out of him to make himself a grounded fighter. And the position could have stayed, it could have gone, and we would have seen possibly a little bit difference in that fight. But Kevin came in, he stopped it, he was right for doing it. It was an illegal knee based upon, if you're just saying, you know, in that fingertip, if you're allowing that, okay. But you saw quickly, Hani tried to milk it a little bit. All of a sudden he goes down on his knees, that knee did not hit him hard, okay? It scraped by him. And Kevin quickly looked at it and said, you know what, get up. You know what, you're ready to fight. And he got the fight going again. And he gave the minimum penalty that he could to Damon by Damon lost the position that he had. He had a good position with Hani up against the fence. That's not, you know, an easy thing to get. And so he loses that position. He doesn't take a point off of him. He shouldn't have. And he gets the fight going again. So you look at it, this is, you know, it's one of those rules that, you know, it needs to be clarified in a better fashion. It needs to be where we really determine what are we going to say is, you know, our version of for everyone to know what is a grounded fighter? What is it that I'm going to say is good? And what is I going to say? No, that's not you grounding yourself. You're trying to play the game. Brian Stan on the Fox Sports 1 broadcast said, it's a good call, but I just hate this rule. I'd love to see this rule eliminated. That's a strong yeah. stance. I think Brian Stan's a phenomenal commentator. I like where he's going with this. I just don't know what the destination would be. I don't know how you change this. You know, there are ways to change it. And, you know, basically, you know, what I'm telling guys, you know, bearing weight on your hand, it's going to change things because at least if someone has to bear weight, it's not that little thing where their fingertip is on the canvas, it's off. It's on. Bearing weight is something that you've got to purposely try to get up. You know, I tell fighters all the time if they're going to put their hand down, I want you to bear weight on your hand. And once your hand is on the ground, leave your hand on the ground until you are going to get up. And when you decide to get up, then I'm telling you, get up because you cannot pick your hand up. See a knee coming, throw your hand back down. Your hand beats the knee. It's going to be a legal knee. Your hand was off of the ground when that knee was thrown. It's legal. If it hits you, if it knocks you out of the fight, then I'm going to wave the fight off. And when I wake you up, I'm going to say, what did I tell you in the back? <laughs> John, it's amazing how many high-level fighters, really accomplished veteran pro MMA fighters don't know this rule. It's like three points of contact is this urban legend that somehow came into our sport. It was never three points of contact. I think this confounds more fighters than anything else in the unified rules. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that confound fighters because there's so <laughs> many – well, it's not it's not the fighter's fault, really. There's so many iterations. You know, I was lucky enough that I was part of, you know, writing rules for the sport from the beginning. And then when we got to the unified rules, I was there for that. And so I knew exactly, you know, because I was the one arguing. You look at, no, you can't do this. Yes, you know, you have to have it this way. But when with what's said in a room and what's agreed upon and then what's put down on paper – sometimes is not, you know, equal in allowing someone to understand exactly what that rule is meant for, what it was intended to say. And when people sit there and read something off of a piece of paper, then they get their own perceptions and their own ideas as far as what the rule means. And that has happened throughout, you know, MMA with the unified rules. We've had a lot of officials come up with their own ideas of what that rule means. You know, and I've gone, you know, all over the world 
you know, breaking bad habits with officials saying, no, that is not what this rule is. This is what it means. Well, I've been told, I don't care what you've been told. I'm telling you, I was there. Name me the person that told you that rule that was there. And they can't. And so it's a matter of, you know, clarifying is not sometimes an easy thing. And it's something that needs to be done. But we've gotten past a lot of these uh, perceptions, you know, 12 to 6 elbows. We get guys on the ground. I can't, I can't elbow. Here, yes, you can. The only thing you can't do is that one straight up and down linear elbow. That's it. Any other little angle change makes it legal. We have people all the time saying, that's, you know, I got, I got Travis Brown throwing elbows that would be basically from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. That's illegal. No, it's not, you moron. It's legal. He's doing a great job. <laughs> So, you know, people get their own ideas of a rule, and once they have it in their head that they think they know what's, you know, what's right, then they're going to go with that, even if it's not what the rule is intended I, to do. I think a lot of fans are rightfully fascinated by what goes on in the actual rules meeting, the fighters meetings, when you meet one on one, and you're not saying you can't pull the hair, you can't fish hook, you can't <laughs> eye gouge. You're I see a lot of officials that do it. Talking about these very subtle points, like what makes you grounded? Yeah, I, I do too, and, and you have to laugh. It's like if you're a pro MMA fighter, especially for a major organization like Bellator or the UFC or one championship, you probably should know by now that you can't actually gouge out your opponent's eyeball. I think we're moving past that point. <laughs> But it's the subtleties. It's the gray areas like, well, when am I actually a grounded fighter? That's what you're talking to them about. Yeah, well, you know, any official that, you know, as simple as it gets, you know, and I've seen, you know, plenty of officials and I, I have my own little sayings. And when I teach courses, you know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, you know, there are officials out there that go and start talking to a fighter and they've, and they've got a sheet of paper in their hand or they'll do a fighter's meeting with all the fighters and they've got this sheet of paper and they'll say, okay, we're going to go over the rules all right, and they've got this sheet, and they start looking at the sheet of paper, and they say, okay, uh, no headbutting, no eye gouging, oh, no biting, yeah. no hair pulling, no throat strikes, and they start going down this list. And it's, it's and, printed off of the ABC website. It's insufferable. Yes, I've seen it a it, lot of times. And what they're talking about is fouls, and I tell them, I said, all right, let, let's just make this as simple as I can make it. If I ever see you do that again, I will slap them fuck out of you okay <laughs> and i mean it because you just told the fighters you don't know the you don't know the rules if you need to read them off of a sheet of paper we got a problem okay this is not your time to show how stupid you are <laughs> this is your time to show exactly that you know what i'm the guy in charge i know what's going on this is what i'm going to allow this is what i'm not all right i'm going to ask you are there anything is there anything within the fouls of the unified rule that you're not sure about? And you can ask the fighter, and they're usually going to say no. Okay, well, then I'm going to start talking about a couple of them just so we, we're clear on what you think is the rule and what I'm going to tell you is the rule. And then I'm going to talk about bout conduct and what I'm going to say. You know, when I say something in the ring, there's, you know, you, a lot of times we're mic'd. In Bellator, I'm mic'd. In the UFC, I'm mic'd. And people hear me and they go, why is he saying that? Well, I'm not saying it for your benefit. I've told the fighter in the back what it means. When I say this, this is what it means. And so I'm telling you, this is what I expect of you. I'm never going to ask the fighter a question during the fight. I'm only going to make statements that I've talked to him in the back about. This is what it means, and this is what I expect you to do when I say it. And so it's a communication with the fighter that they understand and they know what's expected of them so they can continue on in the fight if they want in the fashion that they are. So everything about that backroom talk with the fighter is usually beneficial for the referee and the fighter as far as the bout conduct. What is the referee going to do? What does the fighter need to do? What can the fighter expect? What is the referee going to say in these situations? And what does the fighter need to do to respond? That's what makes you a good official. John, and in the big picture, I, I know that, that you're really the, the founding father of this theory. Solve your problems before the fight starts. Solve your problems in the one-on-one <laughs> -on -one communication with the fighters. Yep. Now, you know, and that's, that's it. It's, there's no secret to this. It's, this is not magic. This is common sense. But the more things that you can take care of before they ever happen, the more things that you can think about as far as the situation and what am I going to do when that situation occurs. So you have your answer before the test is ever given to you. You're going to do well. If you don't have the answer and all of a sudden the problem pops up and you don't know how to answer it, now you start to 
have problems, the world starts to spin real fast, and we start to make mistakes. And that's what we're always trying to avoid. And I've seen you give your fighter meetings, Kevin McDonald, Rob Hines, Herb Dean, top, top officials, the best in our sport. The fighters appreciate it. And I will tell you that the fighters appreciate the one-on-ones a lot more than the group meeting where there's 60 people sitting in the empty auditorium because that's when you see the eyes start to roll and people starting to text and tweet and look at their phones. The one-on-ones, I can tell, and you can tell too, you read the body language, the fighters are appreciative that you're actually giving them this time. Yeah, well, it's important that they understand exactly what you expect of them. And it's important that they are able to say, well, what if I do this? You know, what about this? And you need to be able to answer those questions for them. So when they go out there, there's no doubt in their mind what's expected of them, what they can do, and what is going to be said under certain circumstances and what, when we say it, what it means and what they need to do to respond to it. So, John, the lesson learned here, if you're a referee listening to this program and you read off the unified rules, John is going to slap Careful, you. <laughs> John will slap the fuck out of you. <laughs> you, know, you, know, it, you can ask people that I've trained. I tell them all the time, don't do it. I swear to God, I will walk up and just gangster slap you because you're, you're making <laughs> all of us look stupid. Now, it's, it's a matter of if you want to be part of something, if you want to do this job, then – God dang it, do it, but do it right and learn and take the time that it takes to make sure that there's nothing out there that can happen that you don't know how to handle. And that's the real question. There's a lot of guys that are out there doing fights that if a certain problem comes up, they don't know how to handle it. And <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a final, and it's the problem. As a final thought on this, can you imagine in an NFL locker room, the officials come in to both teams? Who's the kicker? Okay, if you kick the ball through that H-looking thing, you're going to get three points. Any questions? All right, let's see. What constitutes a safety? What's a touchdown? It's laughable, but yet we see that in high-level MMA bouts all the time in yeah. often really good commission states. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and, and part of it is because those people have never seen it done any other way. They've never had anybody there that has mentored them to say, look it. You need to make sure that, well, when we go on the back and we're going to talk to a fighter, I don't want you to be, you know, I don't want you to be this guy that's, you know, I'm the boss, you know, I'm, you know, be a dictator out there. I want you to have a good rapport with the fighter. I want you, you know, them to know that you're, you know, just happy to be in there. You're honored to do their fight and you're there to make sure that they're safe and that the rules are followed to the best of their ability. And that's what, you know, our job is. But that communication time that you have with that fighter, that can be everything that makes your life easy or it can absolutely, if you don't do it right, it can be what makes your life miserable out in that cage. So it's just one of those things that as you get you know, more experienced as an official, you learn. The more I do in the back, the better I'm going to be out front. John and I are back with you next week for an all-new episode of Let's Get It On, first available on Friday. Download and subscribe to our podcast on the iTunes Store. For Android, download the Stitcher app and subscribe. And you can go straight to our website, letsgetitonpodcast.com. You can also find us on social media, facebook.com slash letsgetitonpodcast, and on Twitter, at Podcast MMA for this show, and for us personally, at John McCarthy MMA and at Sean Wheelock. To ask us a question, make a comment, or inquire about becoming a sponsor of Let's Get It On, email us directly at info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. Again, that is info at letsgetitonpodcast.com. And of course, as we always ask you to do, please help us spread the word wherever you are listening around the world. This is your podcast as much as it is ours. For Big John McCarthy, our producer Chris Lakin, and our entire crew, I'm Sean Wheelock. Thanks for listening, everyone. Let's get it on with Big John McCarthy and Sean Wheelock, only on the Ignotainment Media Network. Don't forget to leave a rating and review in the comments section of the iTunes Podcast Store. If you have questions, comments, or are interested in sponsoring the show, contact us at info at letsgetitonpodcast.com or check out our additional lineup of podcasts, including Ocho Man, Behind the Eight Ball. The Whiskey Philosopher and Youth Baseball Talk at Ignotainment.com.